Would you guys turn with me to Acts chapter 2? That would be great. We're continuing in the storyline series, and we're, uh, we're getting into, in my opinion, what might be like the most exciting chapter uh, that applies to us today, and that's the coming of the Holy Spirit, the beginning of the church that Jesus came and died for so that we could be His, and Him gathering a people together. And so, uh, let's just jump right in. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And so this day of Pentecost is this big Jewish festival. It's one of three that if you were like a God-honoring, law-abiding Jew, you, you came to Jerusalem and you celebrated it there. This day uh, is called Pentecost, which in the Greek language means 50th, meaning it's 50 days after the Passover. So if you're starting to put this together, you realize this is 50 days after Jesus, uh, his crucifixion and resurrection. It's roughly 10 days after Jesus left and went into heaven. So these people have been waiting around in Jerusalem for 10 days, waiting for this spirit thing, whatever this helper was that Jesus had been promising. And Jesus said some wild things. He said, it's actually better for you that I go, because when you receive the spirit, he will be with you always, where Jesus was limited to one physical body in one geographical location like you and I are with our bodies. Uh, Jesus was saying, as soon as I leave, I can pour out my spirit on all people, and it's actually better for you. So this is that day of Pentecost. The Jewish festival uh, is called Shavuot or Shavuot. If you speak Hebrew, you know I probably mispronounced that, and I'm, I'm genuinely sorry. Uh, it's also known as the Feast of Weeks or the Feast of Harvest, and it's a celebration of the beginning of the end gathering. And I think it's so cool that God chose the Pentecost or this uh, Feast of Gathering to pour out His Spirit, because this is traditionally when we read that God gave the law on Mount Sinai, and then when God pours out His Spirit here on Pentecost, it's, it's all lining up, and it's all really, really cool. So here they are, one place, this day of Pentecost. Verse 2 is when things start to get a little freaky. Suddenly, there came the sound from heaven as a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. What they didn't realize is one of the disciples had turned on the air conditioner because it was really hot and stuffy, and that's all. No, 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 I'm sorry. No, I'm reading that wrong. No, so this mighty wind, the sound, fills the whole house where they were sitting. And I love that this first... um, institution of the the spirit where he's coming down like they hear him approaching like a locomotive there's this mighty sound like a mighty rushing wind and it fills this whole house and there's this idea of it's corporate it's it's for everybody it's universal with these believers who are gathered and and like sound is it's it's immaterial and, and yet it's still real you can't grab sound or measure the weight or the quantity of sound but at the same time it's it's undeniable it's perceptible and so it's filling the room Then, after that, as if that weren't enough, there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire, and one sat upon each of them. So imagine how weird it would be to hear this odd, ethereal, rushing, mighty wind sound filling up the room, but apparently there's no explicable reason for it. And then from apparently nowhere, this uh, flickering, flaming tongues of fire like come down and split apart and rest upon the head of each individual. Like, obviously we can learn the more godly you are, the more spirit you have, you're going to get bald really fast because there's literally a fire on your head, right? Like Elisha was bald and kids made fun of him and he called bears upon him. And if you can just get like, if you're a believer and you're bald, you're super spiritual. So that's really cool. But again, I love this idea of fire because it's dynamic. It's, it's a little bit ethereal like that sand because it's immaterial once again. You can't take fire and measure the weight of it or you can't put it in your pocket for later. It's just this interesting thing and this, uh, what I feel like is God teaching us a bit about the, uh, the spirit, how dynamic he is, how real he is and yet immaterial at the same time he is. Verse 4, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And this is what changes history. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. In the Old Testament, the Spirit exists. He didn't just get made up right here. He's not suddenly patented and then, you know, pushed upon these people as, this is the new design God has just come out with. How cool. But instead, this is the same God that we've been worshiping. Yet in the Old Testament, the Spirit was given uh, in certain instances to only specific people for a finite amount of time. It's as if uh, the spirit were water, and the analogy would be God just dipping his fingers in water and kind of like spritzing people with it, right? It it was real. It was great. The spirit did wonderful things in the Old Testament, but he came and went. He could be given. He could be taken away. He was given in the instance of King Saul against Saul's will, and it's just a really interesting study of the spirit in the Old Testament. But from here on out, the spirit is given in full measure. 
We're not just sprinkled, but we're filled till we're overflowing with this Spirit of God. These men were the first to do so, and when they were filled with the Holy Spirit, it says they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, this isn't like angelic language. They're not like charismatic people, like just going for it, right? We don't see that here at Anthem. But what we do see uh, is Paul talks about that later in 1 Corinthians, but that isn't the word he's using here. What he's referring to is these men supernaturally are speaking in known human languages that they previously did not know. They haven't studied them. They've never spoken these languages as far as we know. Supernaturally, they're given the gift of languages, which is kind of important if you're going to be declaring that Jesus is the resurrected king. Now, remember, this is Pentecost. If we were good, devout Jews, we would recognize the significance. There are God-fearing Jews from all over the known world who have gathered in Jerusalem to worship through this feast. Whether or not they understand that Jesus was the Messiah is beside the point. They're still there doing this Old Testamental, sacrificial feast type of worship. And so they're from everywhere. They speak different languages. They have different dialects. It would be very, very hard for the original disciples to speak in Aramaic and to reach such a broad demographic of people. It's such a wonderful cross-section of all God's worshipers across the known world assembled in one point. And so God supernaturally unlocks uh, this chasm of of language and says, no, you're going to speak to everybody. doesn't matter what language is their native tongue. They're going to receive your message in their own language, and it's going to make sense to them. It's kind of cool. It's kind of like those UN meetings where everybody has like the little earbud and they're always listening. I don't, okay, nope, all right. So um, 5 through 13 are the verses that kind of explain this. People are, are marveling. What's going on? They're taking note that something unique is happening. Perhaps it's even supernatural. Maybe even it has to do with the Lord. And some people are very amazed and they have this, this intrigue, this awe and wonder. What's going on? We should, we should listen to this miraculous message that we're hearing. And there are others that say, nah, they're just drunk. They're crazy people. Never mind the fact that they're articulating in many different languages simultaneously. And it's funny how throughout Scripture, there's always doubters. There are always people of descent. There are always naysayers that despite the overwhelming supernatural abundance of God's power and presence, they will always deny it no matter what. We see this throughout Jesus, despite his miracles, despite his resurrection, even his ascension, there are always people in the presence that just choose to doubt. So Peter gets up in verse 14, and he starts uh, his big rebuttal, and it's, it's pretty good. And notice just Peter through this little character study, like how transformed Peter is after he receives the Holy Spirit. Like remember who, who Peter is, like he's emotional, and he kind of flies off the handle, he seems to have a bit of a temper, whatever he does, he's all in, let's give him that, but generally they're like really rash and stupid decisions that he makes. Like, this is the same Peter who rebuked Jesus when Jesus said he was going to die and be resurrected. I mean, this guy just doesn't understand Jesus' explicit teaching. He doesn't know how to make sense of the old prophets and the prophecies about the Messiah. This is the guy that deserted Jesus just hours after he said he would stay and fight to the death. This is the man who has verbally said he didn't even know Jesus to save his own skin. Like, this guy has made some really terrible mistakes. He's all over the map as far as decision-making goes. Generally, he's wrong. And he's really familiar with receiving consequences to his rash decisions. And yet, we see a totally different Peter from here on out. Peter, standing up with the 11, he raises his voice and he says to them, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. Like, so just days before when Jesus was being arrested and tried, this guy fled. This guy said he didn't even know Jesus. And now, with the Spirit empowering him, he's bold and he's standing up and declaring to all the Jews in this city what's going on and what's taking place. These men are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day. They started counting hours around 6 a.m., when it, generally when it was like sunrise and they started their day, so the third hour would be 9 a.m. So he's saying, like, It's nine. Nobody's drunk at nine unless you have some serious issues, and these guys don't. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And so Peter here starts to lay out this incredible gospel message, and it's really tailored to these law-abiding Jews. And he pulls out first, one instance, this prophecy from the prophet Joel. This comes from Joel chapter 2. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, 
Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men shall have visions. And your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And they all will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heaven above and on signs in the earth below. Blood, fire, vapor, smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's pretty cool because what Peter is in essence telling this, these people is if you're here and you're in Jerusalem and you're celebrating this feast, if you ascribe to this Yahweh God of the Jews, if you honor his law, if you take any credence to what the prophets of old have said, you are bound to believe in the spirit that was promised. It's in your Old Testament. It's in the prophecies. You say you believe the stuff, and this was promised long ago, that in the last days, God would pour out his spirit upon people, and the supernatural would occur, and people would be given insight and supernatural powers, and all of this would be to the glory of God. And in those days, the doors to salvation will be opened, and not just law-abiding Jews by birth will be saved, not just sons of Abraham will be saved, but anybody who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And so Peter here is declaring this this new time. He's He's declaring this new covenant that's all through Jesus and available to anyone who has faith and desires to engage with this Jesus as their Savior. Pretty cool. And it's all capable through this coming of the Spirit. And I love that. And so he goes on, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, A man attested by God to you by miracles, by wonders, by the signs which God did through him in our own midst. As you yourselves know, many of these people had seen Jesus. They had heard him. They had received portions of his miracles or or knew people who had him. Being delivered by the determined purpose and the foreknowledge of God. Now, this is not a seeker-friendly message here. Like, he's, he's Peter still. I mean, he does not have any fear of being offensive So he goes on, you have taken by lawless hands, you have crucified this Jesus, and you put him to death. I don't think he's going to be winning too many awards for this one. But whom God raised up, having loosened the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. For David says concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face. He is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore, my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh will also rest in hope, for you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of joy in your presence. This one's a little harder to dive into, so Peter has to start explaining what he's doing here and where he's going. It seems a little tangential, but he's really tying in these Old Testament uh, passages really well. And, And this one, by the way, is from Psalm 16. He says, Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried. His tomb is with us today. Basically, he just says, let's be frank, let's be candid. David prophesied that someone's soul would not be left in Hades. David prophesied that someone's body wouldn't decay, but he would be resurrected from the dead. So frankly speaking, David died, his body rotted, we all know where his tomb is here in Jerusalem. So clearly David wasn't talking about himself. David was talking about someone else, someone greater than himself. Who could this be but this person, Jesus Christ? Verse 30, therefore being a prophet, Knowing that God had sworn in an oath to him that the fruit of his body, according to his flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning of the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul would not be left in Hades, nor that his flesh would see corruption. And thus far, Peter is on really solid ground, according to the Torah, the Old Testament, the prophets, the Psalms, uh, King David in his life, his writings. This is super safe ground. Any Jew would just wholeheartedly endorse this message. God is real. The prophets have prophesied this pouring out of the Spirit, whatever that is. The prophets all pointed towards this Messiah, and we long for him, and we wait for the consolation and the redemption of our people in the institution of this government that there will be no end, and they all longed for this. But so few of them understood that it was Jesus who was this promised Messiah. They heard the word Christ, but they certainly did not attach Jesus of Nazareth to that office or that position. 
So thus far, he's on perfectly solid ground. Any Jew would hardly endorse this. At this point, he could sit down. He'd get a standing ovation. Everyone would think, oh, how cool that was just to add to our God worship during this feast. But it's Peter. Peter's never going to stop where you think he should. He continues on. And as soon as I find my spot, verse 32, this Jesus, this Jesus of Nazareth, this man that you thought God hated, this man that you thought needed to be put to death, the man you argued with, the man you heckled, the man that you tried to destroy, the man you had falsely arrested. Do you remember the man you had crucified? He's the Christ. He's the one we've been waiting for. He's the one that the entire Old Testament was about. It's this Jesus of Nazareth that God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. What he's referring to here is this 40-day period after Jesus was raised from the dead that Jesus spoke to people. He performed miracles. He validated that he was fully resurrected, that his body was real. That's why we talk about Jesus asking his disciples for some bread and for some fish because he wanted them to know that it was this real physical body that was resurrected from the dead. And Peter here is saying, you've heard the reports. Many of you guys saw Jesus after you also watched him be put to death. You saw him be made alive again. You're witnesses of this. Verse 33. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God, having received the Father, from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and which you now hear. Peter here is linking this two together. If you believe in the Old Testament, if you follow God and honor his law, if the prophecies have any place in your belief system, you are bound to believe in the Spirit. If you believe in the Spirit and the prophecies, the, it, you are backed into a corner because Jesus fulfilled them all. It is this Jesus who is pouring out this Holy Spirit. These miracles and this odd language translation thing that's happening right now in your midst, it's possible because of Jesus of Nazareth and the work that he did. And I love this. That these are God's people and yet they're so unfamiliar with the God that they worship. And it's so easy to make fun of the Jews. It's so easy to make fun of how uh, close-minded they were. But Anthem, I feel like today we still walk in a, a mist of unknown and of, of unneeded confusion when it relates to our God. Where these people are just feeling like the apostles are drunk because they're missing the Holy Spirit in their midst. We as believers ascribe to the New Testament and we say Jesus is good and we're familiar that there is a Holy Spirit, but we don't even know what it is, much less who it is or who he is. And what Peter here is trying to illustrate is that the Holy Spirit is God as much as Jesus is God. And the Holy Spirit is immediate and available and supernatural and here for our help and here to help us proclaim the gospel just as Peter is doing to this crowd of at the moment, unbelieving Jews. And it's such a, a burden for us that we begin to understand this God that we say we love, that we understand the persons of our God that we say we worship and follow and believe in, and yet all too often, we, we are so um, confused when it comes to this God. And our God is mysterious. There is so much more about this triune, this three-in-one God than any human mind could ever contain. Like your wisdom is so far superseded by this person of God that, that there is mystery. And it's okay to have mystery when it comes to our God, but it is unneeded to have confusion. And there's a big, big gulf between mystery and confusion. And yet, to our shame, too many of us walk in confusion according to who our God is. Uh, we've got this cool little schematic that I'm going to have uh, put up on the screen it's not the flux capacitor, I'm sorry. Like, that's not the key to eternal life as cool as it is, but this is a little schematic that helps me understand who our God is. Our God is three in one. That's where we come up with cool words like triune or trinity. They just mean three in one or three in unity. And we can see that the Son is not the Father. The Father isn't the Holy Spirit. The Spirit isn't the Son, and yet they're somehow all fully God. The Spirit is God just as much as the Son is God, just as much as the Father is God, and somehow our one God is three persons simultaneously. There's mystery there, but there should not be a huge amount of confusion in the midst of this. The scriptures are clear about their roles and who they are, that the Father sent the Son, and it is the Son who is pouring out his Spirit, as Peter is illustrating to us here. That we can't have one without the other two, or we can't pick the favorite two or the most obvious two, and then ignore the Spirit because we don't really get it, and it just doesn't make sense 
to us. It's kind of a package deal here with our God. And Peter is illustrating their unity here, that the Spirit is available, and yet the Spirit was poured out by the Son, and the Son is available, but how so? Verse 34, David didn't ascend into the heavens, but he says himself, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. He's using two words here. Lord, the first Lord is all capitals in my translation. It's this this hallowed name of God, this Yahweh, this name that God pronounced as he introduced himself to his people so many hundreds of years ago before this was written. And it's this Yahweh. Yahweh said to my Lord. David is calling someone his Lord. David is referring to whoever God's speaking to is greater than the great King David. David's not talking about himself, but someone greater than him. And to this unknown person, this Messiah, this Jesus of Nazareth, God said, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. And so we see the Father extending the Son to us, the Son fulfilling his duties and extending the Spirit to us so that the Spirit could fulfill his duties. The Spirit points to Jesus. Jesus points us to the Father. Verse 36, therefore, Let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, by the way, who you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And so Paul, or Peter here, I'm probably saying Paul occasionally, I apologize about that. So Peter here, uh, without notes, he's an uneducated man, he's not a rabbi, he's not a learned individual, he's just a blue-collar worker. He gets up in the power of the Spirit, he's reminded of these verses, he quotes scripture, he ties it all together, and in one instance, he preaches an incredible message to many thousands of people. He teaches about the church, he teaches about the Father, he teaches about the Son being Jesus Christ, and he teaches about the empowerment of the Holy Spirit in the lives of all believers without notes, without any preparation. He just gets up and off the top of his head does this through the power of the Holy Spirit. What I'm taking away is I'm not going to do any more sermon prep for the rest of my life, okay? So every Sunday, I'm just going to get up here and wing it. Worked for Peter, right? No, there are not too many of you guys that seem super down with that. That's okay. And so his closing remark, how he's wrapping the bow in all of this, God made this Jesus, who you crucified, both the Lord and Christ, meaning that this Jesus is it. It's all about Jesus. Jesus fulfilled everything. If you're longing for a Messiah, it was this person of Jesus Christ, who, by the way, is simultaneously our God who we claim to worship. What a cool instance of someone just preaching the gospel with all their heart through the power of the Holy Spirit. Super awesome, well done, Peter, and yet verse 37, in my opinion, is like the most powerful demonstration of the Spirit in this entire chapter. Remember, these are the hard-hearted Jews. They missed their Messiah. Not only did they just ignore him and miss him, but they hated him. They were opposed to him, and they sought his death. It is these people that the, the prophecy spoke about. They would have hard hearts. They would have eyes that were blinded so they couldn't see him for who he was. They would have ears that were deafened so they couldn't even receive his message when they audibly heard his voice speaking. And yet, listen to this. They should have just absolutely right then took Peter and stoned him as they'd done with so many other people. And yet, here's what they do. When they heard this, they were cut to the heart. They were pierced to the soul. His message got through the chinks of their armor and God transformed their hearts supernaturally. This isn't because Peter was really handsome and he was just so captivating to look at that they bought into his message. This isn't because Peter had this comprehensive vocabulary and he used such spiritual and lofty words that people just realized he's smarter than me, I should believe in his message. This is a work, a miraculous, supernatural work of the Holy Spirit that softened these people's hearts. And so all they have to say is, men and brethren, what do we do? This is it. Like He has them. Like God has got them in his hands, and they're surrendering to him, and they're they're just asking, okay, I give. I surrender. What do I do? How do I I respond to this message? Peter uh, is quick with an answer. He said to them, repent. Let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And it's that easy, Anthem. It's still that easy today that you repent. It's this turning away from your own wicked and wretched desires and a turning simultaneously towards God and his desires for your life. It's a recognition that you aren't okay by yourself. You need help. You need a savior. It's this confession of your sin, of, of, of confessing your sin to the Lord. Like all of this is rooted in this idea of repenting. 
And after you repent, let each one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission or for the forgiveness of your sins. And followed by the promise, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Period. Universal. If you're a Christian, you have the gift of the Holy Spirit. Not just a sprinkling for a short amount of time, but to be filled and overflowing for the rest of your life and to eternity, you are filled with the Holy Spirit. The same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is not only available to you, but is ever-present with you. And that's why I love this idea of this rushing sound, this mighty wind in the midst of this corporate worship up there in that upper room. It's because it's universal. And when the people of Christ come together, what did Christ say? Where two or more gathered in my name, there I am with them. The Spirit of God is here with us today, and that's why we gather, and that's why we sing songs, and that's why we teach, because a major portion of the body of Christ is the assembly together and the celebration of who He is and what He has done for us. But just as those individual tongues of flame rested upon the individual heads, you yourselves are, are, are containers that are holding this wonderful treasure of the Holy Spirit. When you go out and, and we can't see you and you're on your own and you do and you think and you say and you act the way you want to, you are still just as filled with the Holy Spirit as you are now. He is just as present with you in your individual context as he is now. And what a gift that is. What a wonder that our God loves us and puts up with us and forbears upon the judgment of our sin so that we can continually repent and turn to him and have this Holy Spirit indwell within us. What a humbling thing. We begin to understand. We need to understand this Holy Spirit. And he's got so many names. In, in the New Testament, he's referred to as the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Eternal Spirit. Then he's got a lot of spirit of names. He's the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of God. He's the Spirit of truth and of life, the Spirit of glory, the Spirit of holiness. He is a Spirit of adoption. He's also a Spirit of judgment and fire. And we can read uh, in some awesome passages, like Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit. When you have the Spirit, He changes you. He transforms you from the inside out. He gives gifts to His church that we read about in 1 Corinthians 12. He's called a comforter, a counselor, a helper. He is a seal. He is, he is a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. He is our guide, our intercessor. He is our teacher, our witness, and obviously a gift giver and the maker of the sp spiritual fruit. The Spirit is in us. He is in our midst, and He is in us. Let us celebrate Him. Let us recognize that our God is triune, that, that our God loves us and has been poured out to us, that if you believe in this Jesus, you receive the supernatural power of the Spirit that raised Him from the dead. And why does that matter? That matters because you are not alone. It's not up to you to be perfect. You don't have to fix yourself. You don't have to save the world. That's not your job. It's God's job and his spirit that lives within you if you will take heed, if you will obey and recognize his voice, it is him who will transform you. I dare you to try to fulfill the fruit of the, the, fruit of the spirit this week on your own. It's impossible. You can't even do one by yourselves. But as we take time with our Lord, as we abide, as Jesus says in John, as we pray and, and grow in his word and spend time in the context of spiritual community, that, that spirit of God will be ever more present in ways that we can recognize. That we'll begin to hear his voice and distinguish it from our own will. We'll be able to love and, and be quick to obey his leadings as opposed to be deaf towards his callings in our lives. It is the Spirit that fills us, and then that ought to change how we view our world and how we view our role in this gospel message. It, it ought to change us from being timid people to being bold people like this Peter fellow who was absolutely transformed. That we don't have to be afraid of the consequences, we just have to faithfully preach this gospel message. And it's always, always served cold and hard. That's the way the truth comes at us. And Peter didn't shy away from it. This Jesus, who you crucified... He's both Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Bummer deal. You're going to have to deal with this guy you hated. You're going to have to become friends with who you had sworn off as an enemy. And the same thing holds true. And so we continue in verse 40. With many other words, he testified and exhorted them, mainly because preachers just never know when to quit, right? And he said, be saved from this perverse generation. And this is the gospel message. It hasn't changed. We still implore people, be saved from this wicked and perverse generation. The first part of the good news is bad news. You're a sinner. 
without Jesus Christ, your, your destiny is hell and judgment and separation. Like, we need people to understand the brokenness and the depravity that they live in apart from Jesus. There's no getting around that. If you remove that part from the gospel, you've created a false gospel. And so Paul preached the message, be saved from of this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received the word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. That's a pretty successful sermon. You got to admit, right? And then, like, just from a planning perspective, like, how do you baptize 3,000 people in one day? Like, that's a, lot, that's a lot of, like, baptism shirts that they'd have to order and get screen printed and, man, alive. So the church is growing, and it's blossoming, and from here on out, the church grows uh, to such an exponential uh, account that, that they can't even figure out how to do church. And it's beautiful, and it's growing, and it's an organism, and how wonderful it is, and yet it's got issues, and we're still dealing with people that don't understand or who are willfully ignorant, who, who fall back into sin, and that's what so much of the epistles are about. You foolish people, why are you doing this again? Uh, guys, that's really perverted, and you need to stop doing that. Like, how could you even imagine that's okay? But, but it's the church, and that's where we're at, Anthem, is we, we are a church, and, and we're beautiful, and we're glorious, and, and we are what will save this world as chosen by God, and yet, yet somehow we're still mess-ups, and we're still screw-ups, and some of us don't even understand really what this is all about, but somehow, through the power of the Spirit, God has chosen you to transform this world. And he has filled you with the very same spirit that raised Christ from the dead. And that ought to change the way that you feel empowered. That ought to change the way you view yourself in this world. Verse 43. This is what happens when people are spirit empowered. Then fear came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together. They had all things in common. They even sold their possessions and their goods, even their 2010 minivans, and they divided all that was among them as anyone had in need. This is such a beautiful picture of the church. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple, with breaking of bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and with simplicity in heart, praising God, and they had favor with all people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Man, I hope we would all agree on this one thing. This view of church is beautiful. I want to be a part of this church. But we have to remember, this is, this is a spirit-empowered church. You don't just get the end of Acts 2 without the pouring out of the spirit in the beginning of Acts 2. And there are some of us here who have been part of religion, who have been part of church attendance for so long that we've either forgotten that the power of the living God is within us, or perhaps we've just never really got the gospel message. Maybe today's your day. If you're not his, if you haven't repented, if you haven't been baptized and received the Holy Spirit, like, why not now? Why not turn from your wicked ways and be saved by this Jesus who is your Messiah? For those of us who are believers, who are just caught up in sin and who are so much more depraved than we are being made righteous, like, repent. This God will save anyone who calls upon his name. Maybe today is a day to rededicate your life to this living God. Let us be a church who is spirit-empowered. Man, I want to be a church that sees miracles and who sees growth every single week, not so that we can brag, we're the biggest church and la, la, la. Like, who cares? But I do care about souls getting saved from hell. I hope you, I hope you cry about that. I hope that breaks your heart. I hope you're willing to give up anything in this world so that this message could be shared with others so that they can come into this family as well. And thank God for sending Jesus. Thank Jesus for sending his spirit. May we be filled with that spirit this week. Let's pray. Lord, I often wonder how horrified we would be if we recognized uh, the power that we just so flippantly invoke when we call upon your name. I wonder if we'd be horrified if we knew more about you as we claim to have you here in our presence today. How would that change the way we worship? How would that transform our inner dialogue and our thoughts? How would we see other people if, if we really understood how you saw them? Lord, whatever those answers are, we, we want them. God, we want more of you. We want to be transformed by you. We thank you for Jesus. He, he's everything. He's so good. Thank you, God, for, for giving your best so that you could redeem us. God, we thank you that you allow Jesus to pour out his spirit in these latter days 
so that you will fill us and you will, you will be with us and, and you are universal around this globe to anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord Jesus. God, I pray you would help us to discover those supernatural gifts that your spirit has embedded within each one of these souls. I pray that they would no longer remain dormant and latent, but I pray that we would discover them and we would utilize them, Lord God, to make this church better, to make your kingdom better, to make this world safe. Help us to not do any of this on our own power, but do all of it in submission and reliance upon you. God, we wanna see miracles. We wanna see people healed. We wanna see souls saved, Lord God, not, not so that we can brag, but that you can be glorified. May it be so in our midst, Lord Jesus, we pray, amen.